store manager became upset when several customers began arguing over who was next in line to be served. So the next day, the store manager issued a policy that every customer must take a number in order to be served, no exceptions. When their number was called, the server would assist them with their ice cream order. One hot school day afternoon, I walked into this ice cream store with my three-year-old daughter. There were no other customers in the store. When I tried to get the young server to wait on us, she insisted we take a number. I thought she was joking. There were no other customers in the ice cream store. When I reminded her of this fact, she pleaded with me to take a number so her manager, who was working in the back room of the store, wouldn't get upset with her. So I politely took a number. It was 62. The young lady looked up on her electronic counter and proceeded to call number 58. So she continued because there was no reply. Number 59, number 60. I interrupted her and said, excuse me, but I have number 62. To which she replied, I'm sorry, sir, you'll have to wait your turn. I couldn't take it anymore. I took my daughter by the arm and said, we're leaving. The last words I remember hearing from the ice cream server over the muffled sobs of my daughter, who now was crying because she didn't get her ice cream cone, were, but sir, I'm almost at number 62. Well, we left and drove three miles to the next ice cream store to get my daughter her chocolate chip ice cream cone. By the way, I've never gone back to that first ice cream store. That story is about many things. Inept management, bad policies, poor service, but it is also an excellent example of unwillingness. I could tell by her voice that the 18-year-old ice cream server didn't like the take a number policy of her boss, but she reluctantly enforced it to keep her job and please her boss even when it bordered on the absurd. The bottom line to this unfortunate episode is this. If the ice cream store manager believed in empowerment, she could have gathered her associates together and created a workable solution to their problem. Empowerment equals creative solutions, but rules inhibit solutions. The third most important factor is capability. This means simply, do your people have the talent, training, information, and other resources necessary to do the job? There are many people who might be willing to be empowered, but are they capable of performing the job? Capability is about training and educating your people to get it right the first time to succeed. When we empower someone to do a job, we must also be sure they possess the talent and training necessary to do it. It's like the child who is willing to drive the car but lacks the basic ability to steer it or reach the gas and brake pedals. It is unwise to turn an employee loose on a project if they lack the ability to succeed. Our job as managers is to grow our people so that they develop their abilities and succeed. Capability is also about providing your employees with specific information they need to solve problems and complete the task. People must have access to technology that will provide them with current data and information. For example, if you ask an associate to plan the company's annual sales meeting, they will need a great deal of information as well as a list of attendees and information on many aspects of the meeting, including destination, hotel selection, recreational activities, speakers, and the program agenda. If you fail to provide specific information to your associate, their decisions may be affected. The processes and systems they need to establish in order to create successful outcomes 
might be inadequate because of too little information or misinformation. The fourth factor for empowerment is feedback. Every employee needs to know the answer to the question, how am I doing? This is why it is imperative for managers to help their associates establish a feedback system which they can monitor and share the results with management. This is how a manager or a supervisor ensures a good performance and predictable outcomes. It is not the job of the manager to track the data or play watchdog role over his associates. In the empowered organization, associates, colleagues, or work teams establish their own benchmarks and criteria for excellence, and they measure that criteria and track their progress on a regular basis. Every member of the work team knows how well they are performing or where adjustments need to be made on a daily or weekly basis. This is empowerment at its best. Now you can see why it is important for management to focus not only on the details of a project, but more importantly, on the long-range strategies that will solve bigger problems down the road. The second part of the feedback factor is also very important. Once an employee has been empowered with the task and received your complete trust and cooperation, your job as the manager or supervisor shifts to that of coach and mentor. As a manager, you have an important coaching role to play in the success of growing your associates. They will need to ask questions, seek your advice, and look to you for guidance and even clarity of direction to keep them on track. This last factor, recognition, is also very important because it completes the empowerment loop. When people willingly accept a challenge, you must recognize their efforts and accomplishments so that others in your company or department will want to model that same behavior. Recognition can take many forms, public praise, money, vacation time, or a plaque to name but a few. But whatever form you choose to salute your champions, it is important that you always be positive and sincere. Never use a public recognition event to downgrade someone or tease them about their shortcomings. As a manager, this is your opportunity in front of all your internal customers to tell them how much you appreciate their efforts and value them as colleagues. Let me share with you a brief case study relating to empowerment and how one senior executive applied all five factors of empowerment to grow his organization. This example deals with personal empowerment and organizational empowerment. This case study concerns a noted individual from the annals of business and two companies we are very familiar with. In 1977, Lee Iacocca was president of Ford Motor Company. You might say he was on top of the world. He had a very distinguished career with Ford Motor Company. However, six months later, Iacocca's world came tumbling down when Henry Ford fired him. But within a year, Lee Iacocca was back at the helm of another automobile manufacturer, the Chrysler Corporation. As you may recall, in 1978, Chrysler was in serious financial trouble. Its stock price was way down and its sales were depressed. Chrysler was on the verge of filing for bankruptcy. This was the situation Lee Iacocca inherited. Iacocca knew that in order to transform Chrysler into a profitable company, he needed to accomplish three things. First, he needed to restore leadership to the company. The old guard was tired and trying to maintain the status quo instead of moving Chrysler forward. Secondly, Chrysler needed money. The auto giant was broke and Iacocca needed to find a way to increase cash flow. And thirdly, Chrysler needed new products that would 
capture the imagination of consumers in the United States, Mexico, Latin America, and Europe. With the introduction of Japanese automobiles, the big three auto manufacturers, General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler, were losing market share. And they needed to build cars that could recapture the imagination and confidence of consumers. As Lee Iacocca tells the story in his autobiography entitled Iacocca, empowerment played a key part in his success at Chrysler. Let's examine how Iacocca applied the five factors of empowerment to resurrect the dinosaur of a company. He attempted to create a culture of trust. One of the first things Iacocca did when he arrived at Chrysler was to visit the various company plants and talk with the auto workers who were assembling the cars. On the shop floor, he dispensed with his suit coat and rolled up his sleeves and listened intently to the comments and suggestions of his employees. Iacocca didn't tell his employees they needed to work harder and make fewer mistakes. Instead, he asked them for advice on what he should do to restore Chrysler to a position of greatness. His willingness to listen sent out a message throughout Chrysler. It told his employees that Iacocca didn't have all the answers and he needed the help of his employees. He trusted them. In return, they gave him invaluable advice. How many times has your CEO visited the shop floor and sat down with the employees and listened to their suggestions and concerns? Iacocca displayed willingness. By accepting the challenge of restoring Chrysler to profitability, Iacocca told his employees he was prepared to go the distance and do whatever was required to save their company. To prove his commitment, Iacocca agreed to work for a salary of one dollar per year. Of course, he had stock options, but the price of Chrysler's stock was about three dollars it had hit bottom. So Iacocca was putting his money where I'm willing to bet my income on the future of this company. Are you? And they did. He convinced the United States government to loan Chrysler $2 billion. He also received wage concessions from the United Auto Workers Union, which was thought impossible. Not only was Iacocca willing to tie his future to Chrysler's, but he made sure everyone else, from the stockholders to the federal government to the auto workers and managers, was willing to do the same. Iacocca also displayed capability. Certainly Iacocca had experience and understood what had to be done at Chrysler. But were the problems so great that they could not be solved by one person? Iacocca realized that in order to succeed, he had to focus every ounce of energy on convincing a reluctant United States Congress to agree to the Chrysler loan package. He also needed to tap the creative minds of his engineers and product design teams to create exciting new cars that consumers would buy in record numbers. He empowered his employees to get the job done by eliminating work rules and policies that inhibited productivity and creativity. He fired several vice presidents and replaced numerous managers who impeded progress. Iacocca, like every successful leader, was capable of making hard decisions that were sometimes unpopular, and he did just that. Yet another factor in the Chrysler success story is feedback. One of the many innovations at Chrysler was the introduction of quality control methods. Although Chrysler enjoyed an excellent reputation for its well-engineered products, most departments were isolated from each other. Many divisions were viewed as independent fiefdoms, that is, little kingdoms ruled by an autocratic division manager who did whatever he wanted, regardless of how that decision affected the common good. What Iacocca instituted at Chrysler was a measurement and feedback system that required everybody to support common goals, to save money, 
encourage innovation, and promote sales. At weekly meetings, Iacocca held his senior managers accountable for achieving the various goals he set forth. If they did not show progress, he fired them and replaced them with people who supported his vision and achieved the results. This is how Iacocca used feedback to transform Chrysler's financial and sales performance. Iacocca knew the clock was ticking. Time was wasting away. He wanted action and progress throughout his organization, and he got it by constantly measuring results and getting feedback from his people at all levels of the company, not just the management level. Yet another important aspect of the Chrysler turnaround was recognition. The greatest corporate turnaround in the history of the United States was the rescue of Chrysler by Lee Iacocca. Recognition came to the men and women of Chrysler in many forms. Chrysler repaid its loans ahead of schedule. Consumers returned by the thousands to buy K cars and minivans and convertibles, which Iacocca reintroduced and popularized during the mid-1980s. During the critical period from 1978 to 1983, when the company was barely surviving, Iacocca promised his associates a fair share of the profits once their company was making money. He kept those promises, and when he retired from Chrysler in 1988, the company stock was well above 35 points. Of course, Iacocca made a considerable sum of money as well. But the greatest recognition of all, according to Iacocca, was that he inspired the people of Chrysler to embrace his vision for the future, and in so doing, he trusted them to raise their performance standards and create exciting new products that would generate more sales. This powerful combination of leadership and empowerment is what allowed the new Chrysler Corporation to become a healthy and profitable company once again. I hope you can apply these five factors of empowerment in your organization so that you might enjoy the same levels of success as Lee Iacocca did at Chrysler. In closing this program, I'd like to offer you a means by which you can evaluate your own life and determine whether or not you have empowered yourself in order to attain a higher level of accomplishment and personal fulfillment. At the beginning of this program, I defined empowerment as follows, to enable or give power to someone. Ultimately, our success in life, according to Dr. Stephen Covey, can be measured according to the four L's. The first L represents live. Are you really living your life to the maximum, or are you simply adrift on this planet without a sense of purpose or direction? Let me encourage you to think about the life you lead. Is it everything you want it to be, or are you adrift like the starfish? I'm not suggesting that you have to strap on a parachute and jump out of an airplane from 10,000 meters or plunge off a bridge with a bungee cord tied around your ankle. The key to living is to get it right the first time because this is not a dress rehearsal. It's the real show and the only chance we have to make a difference. The second L represents learning. As you know, learning is a lifelong process. We discussed this earlier when I mentioned the importance of education and training in the life of an effective leader. So be a learner and always be open to new ideas and new ways of doing things so that your life constantly improves. Never let it be said by others that you are like the old dog that won't learn any new tricks. The third L represents love. I have always been fascinated by the fact that human beings are the only species on this planet who are capable of love. To me, the human capacity to love each other is our greatest attribute. I encourage you to never forget that it is people who make the workplace unique, and an effective leader who is committed to growing his or her people must first love them for all their strengths and faults. And finally, the fourth L represents to leave a legacy. 
I don't know about you, but when I'm dead and gone, and people are standing around trying to figure out what epitaph to inscribe on my tombstone, I hope they come up with something more profound than, he made budget. In my own life, I believe my legacy comes down to three things. First, instilling in my two beautiful daughters the values they will need to succeed in life and find meaning and purpose in whatever they choose to do. Secondly, to make a difference in people's lives through programs like this one. And thirdly, finding that ultimate harmony and peace with my Creator. So as we end this session, I encourage you to empower yourself and others by discovering the four L's and making a difference in this world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hinton. Let's begin the second question and answer session. The first fact is coming to us from Costa Rica, from the State University, Distant State Univers Education State University. Is it possible for there to be leaders in organizations or companies with bureaucratic organizational structures? Well, it's not only possible, but of course, every organization has leaders. Uh, I think the question is, to what extent are they effective? And some of the thoughts that I have on this question are, how does a leader uh, break through the policies, the rules, and the procedures so that he or she can create successful outcomes? And when you consider uh, what, what's important to an organization, Ultimately, it's the test of whether or not the leader is able to achieve results. And in order to achieve results, especially in a bureaucratic uh, organization, which is encumbered with rules and policies and procedures, the challenge is how do you get rid of the rules, break the rules within legal uh, limits, of course, and move that organization forward? That's the test of a true leader. In this section, in this second question and answer session, we're having another question coming from Hidalgo, Mexico. This is uh, uh, Roque Luis Lopez. Our question is as follows. What are the types or how can you classify, categorize the leadership according to today's um, uh, uh, lifestyles and for the 21st century's uh, challenges? Well, I don't know that the uh, styles have changed uh, much in the past 20 years. I think you can basically break it down into two styles. Either a, a leader is effective or a leader is ineffective. And the question is, how do you become an effective leader? And I think the way that uh, you, you embrace a style that makes you effective is, again, the clarity of your vision, your ability to communicate your message to your people. And in the process of communicating your message to your people, they have to embrace that message. They have to accept it. Because if they don't, and this goes back to an earlier question that we had in the first part of the program on leadership, if your people do not embrace or agree with your message, they will sabotage uh, your, your efforts. And so the challenge is to be an effective leader. You have to have the vision, communicate your message clearly, and I think ultimately love your people. They'll do anything for you if they know that you really care for them as human beings. And now this question is coming from Guadalajara, Outland, Jalisco, Mexico. The question is, how can you uh, inject confidence in people when they have lost it because of the bad leadership in an, in a period in a former period or another under another leader I think the the key here is if you go back to the text and the story of Lee Iacocca of the Chrysler Corporation Iacocca is a great example of how you take an organization that has hit rock bottom and instill in the people a sense of confidence and vitality that they can achieve great results 
to answer your question very specifically, I think the first thing that you need to do is to convince your people that they are capable of achieving great results. That's the first thing. The second thing is then you have to lay out a plan that will get you to the successful outcome or the goals that you're trying to achieve. And then thirdly, make sure that everybody clearly understands, just like a ship on a, a crew on a ship, everybody understands what their role is and how they contribute to the successful outcome of that plan. And I think that's the way that you overcome this uh, uh, symptom of uh, failure and the conditions that uh, were not worthy of success. I think it's all in the mind and you have to be able to convince people that you're the leader that will take people to that higher level. This question is coming from fa via fax. It's coming from Tijuana, Baja California. The university. What is the importance of spirituality in a leader? Say that once again. Um, what is the importance of the spirituality of a leader in a leader? Well, you're asking me to reveal what's in my next book. <laughs> uh, I I think spirituality. If I can divine that as the core essence of what makes somebody uh, great. It's that, that's, that inner drive, that inner spirit that convinces you that your ideas and goals are worthy. And now the challenge that you have as a leader is to take those inner values and convince others in your organization that they too should follow you because you're right and you have the, the connectedness with a higher purpose and the clarity of direction in your life. To me, that's the correlation between spirituality and leadership. And let me add that I believe that all great leaders are spiritually deep people. Uh, that is not to say that they are affiliated with a particular religion. I don't think it has to do with religion. It has to do with an understanding of who they are and their place in the universe. And I think we're coming to uh, a greater awakening throughout the world that spiritualism is a very important aspect of leadership. Now we have a question coming from Tabasco, Tabasco Mexico. From Thank you. I have two questions. The first one, how can you motivate people to to support a certain vision if they're apathetic, if they're just totally indifferent, and how can you also incentivate or motivate your personnel if you are in the midst of an environment that is so adverse and so changing, so unpredictable? Well, there are two ways that, that you motivate people. You either inspire them or you threaten them. <laughs> uh, what I'm hoping is that as you evolve as a leader that you will be more successful in motivating people and that you won't have to threaten them as much. Uh, but there is a place for both in the workplace, unfortunately, because people, uh, what motivates people to take action are different things um, and different styles are appropriate. Uh, so. When you talk about adverse working conditions in the workplace and apathy, what you're basically saying is that people are not motivated, that they're not inspired, that they're not happy. And the question is, how do you as a leader inject in your people a sense of confidence and trust in you so that they will follow you uh, through thick or thin to achieve results? that they will agree to change. And that's, that's a real challenge for leaders. I think that's what separates great leaders from uh, not so great leaders. And now we have another question coming from uh, via telephone and that comes from Panama Technological University of Panama. In your experience, what would be the, key, the keys to success on a global level? Thank you. 
Well, if we're talking about keys to success from a business standpoint, I believe that there are probably three. Uh, number one, uh, your profitability. And your profitability comes about as a result of whether or not you are satisfying your customers. So you need to satisfy your customers. And I think the third key to success from a corporate standpoint globally is innovation. Are you uh, moving ahead with new products and services that your customers want, not just today, but three, five years down the road? So again, uh, profitability, your ability to, uh, um, well, again, it's tied to the profitability and, and your ability to be innovative with your people. This question is coming from Atoyac, Mexico, Federal Commission of Electricity. Good morning. Do you have a way of measuring leaders, a scale? Well, I think there are two ways to measure leaders. Uh, number one, your stockholders or the voters, if you're an elected official, they'll, they'll measure you uh, by the basis of your results. Uh, leaders are always measured on the basis of their results. But I think equally important is within do you feel in your heart that you are getting results, that you are growing, and that in fact you are growing others? Uh, that's your internal role as a leader, to grow yourself and to grow other people. But you'll be measured on your results. This one is coming from Tamaulipas, Mexico. How can you, how can the leader face the challenge of changing organizational culture when you have opposing forces that would precisely oppose this mission? Does it, it does this mission have to be imposed, or do you have to negotiate it? Well, I think if you negotiate, you're compromising. Uh, and to compromise your values as a leader, I don't think that's the first uh, test that I would, uh, or the first step that I would take, I would try to uh, influence people that your way is the right way. And I think also with respect to uh, opposing views, every organization has uh, those people who think that there is a different way or a better way than your idea. Uh, the test that you face is